looking at the restoration of Israel. But I want to tell you something about Israel today. I want you not to be mistaken. Israel today is in as bad a shape as Israel was when Jesus came the first time. Spiritually. Don't think that they're, they're God's chosen people. I want you to understand that. But they are spiritually in as bad a shape today as they were when Jesus came the first time. They're not any better today than they were then. The only thing about then and today is that they are still God's people. He's their chosen people, and He loves them in spite of them. I want you to understand that. He loves them in spite of them. But He's going to have to break them to make use of them. And the breaking and the crumbling is yet to come. <clears throat> Ezekiel 36 and verse 22. Ezekiel 36 and verse 22. We're going to go and look, some pl look at several places in the New Testament uh, and other places in the Old Testament about what's happening here. I want you to understand what's taking place here. Israel was scattered one day. They were scattered. Why were they scattered? Because, because the king of Israel came to them. They were supposed to know. Jesus said, you should have known the day of your visitation. What was that mean? You should have known. God held Israel accountable when he came to them. And what was the result of that? He said, not many days from now, what would happen? Not one stone will be left upon another, and this place will be ravaged. And they said, huh. You know, this is a gigantic temple, it's a gigantic building and everything. I mean, us, we're God's chosen people. Just keep and remember that. They said, we're God's chosen people. And Jesus said to them, he said, uh, don't worry about that. He said, if God wanted to raise up children, he could raise them up from rocks. You're no better than a rock. Well, we're related to the rocks, aren't we? We're made from the same elements as the rocks. God could bring up, he could completely wipe out the human race altogether and start over again if he's so pleased. He did it one time. <laughs> he did the flood. He divided the earth. I was talking on the radio last night. And they said, well, there's a lot, been a lot of catastrophes in history. And I said, yes, and there's still yet to come. More yet to come. I said, well, look, God destroyed all of mankind and all animals on the earth, just about, that could, that, you know, anything that, that didn't swim in the flood. Then he divided the earth and confused all the languages. The next time, it's going to be with fire. And I was talking about the ring of fire. How many of you know about the ring of fire? Brother X, the ring of fire. That's all the volcanoes. Just look and see what's going on today. Just look about today. What's going on today? We're almost in June, and it's snowing in the mountains. All over the place. It's raining. It's chilly this morning, isn't it? You can wear a coat this morning, because you Yeah. That weather's fine with me, because I'd rather have that than this hot Bakersfield weather. But we had a tremendous earthquake. We've got volcanic eruptions going on right now that have changed the weather so drastically. But what's supposed to happen in the end times? You know, Harold Camping, he put off the end of the, or the rapture from September to October now. That guy has been full of sheep dip all the way to the top ever since I ever heard him the first time. So I don't believe anything he's got to say, nor Garner Ted Armstrong or Herbert Armstrong or any of those predictors. Charles State Russell, <coughs> Joseph Smith, all, they all have eschatology in mind. But I do tell you one thing, we're in the end times. I thought we were 40 years ago. But I can tell you what, it's a whole lot closer now. It's 40 years closer now than what it was back then. I don't know when the Lord is coming back. But I can tell you the things are there. Now let's look at Israel. In the 36th chapter, Israel was going to be scattered. Israel was scattered because they rejected the Messiah. 
And the only reason why is it going to bring them back in the land because he's going to force them to be the administrators of his kingdom again. Look at the map. Look how God dealt with mankind in different periods of time, all right? We're in the church age right now, somewhere right here. When could the rapture happen? Eminently, any moment. All right? Any moment. Then the tribulation comes. Why does the tribulation period come upon the earth? Why is it coming upon the earth? Why is the tribulation period coming upon the earth? We gather the Jews? What? We gather the Jews? To bring the Jews to their knees. That's what it's going to take to bring them to their knees. It's going to take the tribulation period. It's going to take some heat on the seat. I was talking to a guy the other day and I said, and he had trouble with his children not leaving home. I said, well, you get a hole in your hand and a shovel in your hand and put them to work every day. Get you a farm, live out on a farm, have them plant trees, dig up lines and bury the holes again and have them dig them up again. Do something, keep them busy. And when they get to 18 years old, they'll be ready to fly the coop. They won't ever come back in. <laughs> One thing, they'll know how to work. They'll know how to work. When they go to work, when my boys went to work, they thought they were on vacation. <laughs> we work. God's going to pour it on these people. He said in verse 22, Therefore I say to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name which you have profaned among the nations. You went wherever you went. Then I will vindicate the holiness of my great name which has been profaned among the nations which you have profaned in, the, in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations and gather you from all lands and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean, and I will cleanse you from all the filthiness and from all your idols. Romans 8 and the 18th chapter. See, we're doing the book of Romans. We're doing the book of Romans on Wednesday night. The book of Romans, the whole, every doctrine in the New, in the New and the Old Testament is in there. I'm telling you, people. That's one of the greatest books in the Bible. It's like a miniature Bible. Like a miniature Bible. Romans the 8th chapter. 18. For I consider the sufferings of this present time to be not worthy compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. You know that, that mankind has, has, has destroyed the earth. I've said this so many times, but there were so many trees all the way from the furthest part of the British Isles, all the way into the Middle East, that a squirrel, they said, could jump from one tree and never hit the ground for 2,000 miles. They devastated that land with war. The anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. The anxious longing, the groanings, the longings, the suffering of the creation itself waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to what? Sin and futility. Sin and futility. The mountains. How many of you have ever seen fossils? I lived up in Fish Lake Valley for a long time. And you could go up there and see all kinds of stuff. There was a redwood forest up there that was a fossilized redwood forest. You know what happened? Sin hit it. Sin hit it. You go out there and drill. How many of you ever drill any oil and oil wells? Been out there, you drill a mile deep and you got all kinds of fossils down there. You're drilling through fossils. The earth was destroyed. Genesis 1 1 says, In the beginnings, God created a perfect heavens and the earth. And then it says, We, Haaris, and the earth, 
Hathya, she became formless and born. That's what happened. Sin hit the earth. Sin hit it. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. We've studied that. All right. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will. Creation wants to obey God. Animals want to obey God. How many delinquent parents do you see among animals? Huh? <laughs> The little doves mate, they would bring their little children up and everything, the eagles do. Why, they'll die for them. <coughs> they obey God. Well, there's parents running around, oh, go out here and... Well, we live, you know, we're in Old Dale right now. <laughs> you go out here, Old Dale. Slippery City is what I used to call it. Run over there down Chester Avenue and almost all of those women and men have got no teeth in front from dark drugs. No teeth. No teeth. Their children are on welfare and they're taking the money and buying drugs with the welfare money and their daddies and mamas are in games. Totally. A dog wouldn't do that. A chicken won't do that. Not a dove or a bird or a blackbird or whatever. While they'll fight for their young, they try to take care of them because God. they do what God says for them to do. Little frogs. Whatever. Bill. And Jim, I just want to point out that, that something you brought up there to clarify to these people that the, the natural form and order of things that God set in place, you take any animal, they raise their kids up, and they send them off. The humans are the only ones that will support and take kids on through life. Any animal you look at, but only raise them to, their, to, the, to a certain age to work on themselves, and then they're gone. That's the order God set it in. He didn't set it in for us to take care of our rest of our life. The creation was subjected to futility, not of its own volition, but because of Him who subjected it. All right? That the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption. I want you to understand that. That the creation itself will be sent free to the, from the slavery to corrupt, corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And we're almost there on Wednesday night. That's where we are. Just almost right there. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers in pains and childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan, we ourselves groan within ourselves, wanting to be set free. What a child of God, when you become a child of God, the flesh becomes a burden. Doesn't it? It becomes a burden. Because you're tied down to the earth. And your spirit is born from above. Up. A saint means what? What does saint mean? Hagios. What does saint mean? Separated. What? Saint. A saint. The word saint. We get the word saint from Hagios. What does what does that really mean? Separated for the, to, the service to God. People say that, but it means not of earth. That's literally what it means. Not of earth. Oh. Hagios means not of earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hagios means not of earth. Not of earth. We're not of earth. We're not of the physical world. We're born from above. And our spirits and our souls long to be set free. Well, it's a set free ministry. People are, are <coughs> enslaved to drugs and whatever. The whole creation groans and suffers such the pains of childbirth together, not only us, but we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit. We ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our whole body, our whole being. We're triune. That's the good news from the New Testament. Let's go back in Ezekiel now. Why is God going to redeem Israel? Why is God calling them back into the land? Not because they're such good people. I'm going to tell you that. Not because they're wonderful citizens of the world. 
Not because they love God. I keep telling you this, but Brother Madden, when we went to the Wailing Wall, he stood back. He said, I'm not going up there with the hell-bound heathens. They were up there beating their heads on the wall and praying and kissing Bibles and saying, scrolls and stuff. Worshipping idols. Touching that wall and kissing that wall. Like they can't do an idol. That's what it is, an idol. How do you worship God? From your spirit and from your heart. We take the Word of God. We should not... I love God's Word. But this is a... It is an arrow that tells us how to go. And tells us about God and tells us about ourselves. That's why we study the Bible. We're not worshiping the Word of God. We're worshiping the God of the Word. That's different. Yes. And there is some people that after they read their Bible, they close it and they kiss it. Yeah. So is that wrong? Don't do that, but do I have to. What are you doing? If they worship the God of the Bible. I love my work door of God. I write all over. You look look at this. This isn't this a mess right here? It's just written all up. If somebody saw me writing a Bible like that, I've had people see me writing a Bible like that, I'll put it up there on the camera so they can see it. If they saw me writing a Bible like that, I'm profaning, profaning. I'm blaspheming God's Word because I'm writing in it. It's too holy to write in. Brother Phil Neighbor said, that is a, that is a living, working commentary. He said, I never saw anything like this in my life. But I'm gonna, I've got a whole bunch of books just, just like this. Don't I, Mary? Yes. Lots of them. All scrolled up and scribbled up. I worship the God of the Bible. I don't worship the Bible. I've studied the languages of the Bible all of my life and poured it in. I've copied all the New Testament down and every word and written a commentary on it. And I'm still working on the Old Testament. I have lived long enough. I may do it all. I don't know. The Lord's going to have to work a lot more miracles to get me through it. <laughs> I'll take that much. I'll do it if I have a life. Zechariah, the 12th chapter. Zechariah. Anybody got the book of Zechariah in their Bible? Mm -hmm. All right. Zechariah 12. How is God going to get their attention? We find out. We find out that Israel is going to be taken back into the land. We find out that the, they're going to set the Antichrist up. They're going to build a temple and they're going to set the Antichrist up. This, the Antichrist means what? Brother Brett, are you over there? Yeah. Are you in Zechariah? Uh, I'm getting there. Oh, okay. I like that new Bible here. Oh, oh I'm glad to see you. And you've got a pencil in your hand. Yeah. You're a student. Wow. He's like, wow. Amen, sure. boy. A plus today, right off the bat. Yes. A plus. All right. We're not, we're not there yet. But we're, as Zechariah 12 and verse 9 is where we're going to start. Okay? Zechariah 12 and verse 9. That's in the Old Testament, Brett. Right. On page 1,328 in my Bible. <laughs> 1,054. 1,054 years. Okay. Anyway, Israel, Israel is going to be... God is going to have to get their attention by breaking their necks. I remember my, my Uncle Bill, old bad Bill. He, uh, he was always in trouble. I told you about him killing a few people and whatever. Trying to pull my hair out and my ears off and beating me with an axe handle and all kinds of stuff. Boy, he was a bad boy. And when he was in school, he wouldn't talk until he was seven years old. And the doctor came to the house and, and, and they said, What's wrong with Bill? Willie, is what they call him, Willie. What's wrong with Willie? He said he's stubborn. Don't give him anything to drink or eat until he asks for it, because he can talk. There's nothing wrong with him. Two or three days later, he finally said, Water. <laughs> now you give him anything to eat or drink. He finally said, Water. They sent him to school, finally. Now he was seven years old when he learned when he said his first word. Now they sent him to school, and they wanted him to write a poem. So he uh, took a poem and he wrote it. He kind of copied it out of another, but he uses these old terms. He said, "The mule." He got up in front of the classroom. And he said, "The mule stood on the burning deck. 
the land he would not tread. They drew a halter around his neck and cracked him over the head. And they gave him a whooping for that. <laughs> but that's what God's going to have to do. And isn't that what God has to do to get our attention sometimes? Crack us over the head? Get your attention first. Says, knock the way out of you. Now, are you listening? <laughs> are you listening? Brent, did you ever find your way there? Yeah, I did. Okay. Oh, you, are you over there? Yeah. 12 and 9. That's New American Standard, isn't it? Okay, you want to read it? Yes, sir. I want you to read it. And it will come about in that day that I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. All right. Now, this is a bad time now. Okay. At verse 10... Go verse okay. 10 now. And I, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him. Hold on right there now. Now what is going to happen at this time? We talked about this before, and I've made reference to these scriptures. We're going to the scriptures today. Okay? They are in trouble. A lot of people have spare tire religion. You ever heard of that? Or <coughs> they preach on spare tire religion one time. Have you ever heard of that, Sister mm -hmm. Andy, on spare tire religion? They never think about God at all until they get sick. Or somebody dies. And then they want you to pray for them. Or pray for the dead person. Boy, it's too late. It's too late. Some of us might be Catholics that are trying to pray people out of purgatory, but I'm going to tell you what, purgatory doesn't exist. If they're dead, they're already in heaven or hell, one or the other. There's nothing you can do for them. It's too late. That's it. No more. No more. No more. No more. Who the me of? All right. Nothing left. All right. They look upon whom they have pierced. Now, what is that talking about? About Jesus. About Jesus. Who called and demanded. The Roman government did not crucify Jesus. The Roman government was going to set him free. And the Jewish people, national Israel, called and demanded his murder. To murder him on the cross. Because he was... You know what? If you execute a man that's innocent, you have murdered him. Did you know that? In the Bible, if, if America had gone according to the word of God, they would have never, ever executed an innocent man. Did you know that? By two or three witnesses, let everything be established. If you did that, you'd be all right. <coughs> they, they have hung and they have, they have executed a lot of innocent people. They've been turning right and left here, loose here lately because of DNA, haven't they? One to one. Democrats. They weren't the right ones. Well, weren't the right ones. They weren't guilty. The DNA proved they weren't guilty. Also, they caught a few rascals, haven't they? caught one about 80 years old here a while back that was a mass murderer because of DNA. That's a pretty good witness, you know that? That's how God's going to put you back together in the resurrection, you know that? Is your DNA, he go, here you come. God knew about DNA a long time ago. All right, Brother Brett. Now let's look at that. They're going to be in trouble over there. The Antichrist is after them. Okay. And what are they going to say now, Brett? They're going to look. So that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him. As in, in Hebrew, by the way, that's look at. Look at. Okay. at. Alright? Look at me whom they have pierced. And they will do what? And they will mourn for him. They will keep on mourning. Literally, they will keep on mourning. As one mourns for they only. Because of him. All right, because of what they did to him. And the son will weep bitterly over oh, him. Oh, go back. Okay. As one who mourns for an only son, your only child. When you lose your only child, you lost all hope. Especially in those days. That only child was your, that was your social security. That was your welfare program. That was your food stamps. That was what was going to take care of you when you were old, right there. There wasn't anything else. That's how it was. That's the way God provided. Okay? As one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly, it says over him. Go ahead, Brett. Okay, sorry. 
Um, and he's mourns for, for him only, so the sons will weep bitterly over him, like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. And that day there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of Hadraminan, and the plain of Megiddo. And what else? And, the, okay, and in the land uh, will mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves. Every tribe in Israel is going to mourn for what they have done to the Messiah. Everyone's going to mourn. They're all going to be mourning. Now let's just think about salvation, soteriology right now. Soteriology. What does soteriology mean? Anybody here smart enough to know that? Brother Brett, you're a college student. Soteriology. Some study of something. Uh, I like study of uh, Logi in the Logi, all right, in the end of it. Soteriology. comes from so-so. So-so. Huh. 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 So, so. Can you say that? So, so. So, so. That means I save. I save. I preserve life. I preserve alive. When you're born again, you're saved. You're saved. Forever. You're going to be alive. Forever. You're going to be alive. You're going to have a resurrected body one of these days. You're going to be put back together. All together. Good. Okay? For the good. All right? Saved. All right? When you get saved, what happens? How do you get saved? What is the process of salvation? That's something that the world doesn't understand, okay? But the Bible teaches it plainly. Repentance. Repentance. You 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 learn for, from the speed, from the Word of God that you're a sinner. People used to uh, lambast people from the pulpit and say, you you know, you're sinners. Now they say, come up and make a decision. <laughs> Back then we said, repent and believe and trust. Repent of your sins and believe and trust in Jesus Christ. Without repentance and without believing, there is no salvation. There is no salvation. Repent and believe. Okay? They're going to mourn. That's part of repentance, isn't it? They're going to be repenting of what they did to their Messiah King. Okay? Each and every one of them. Let us go back to Ezekiel, the 36th chapter again. Ezekiel 36. I will gather them from all the lands. I will sprinkle them and make them clean. They're going to be born again. But they've got to, they, they've got to be in the skillet first. Have you ever heard of the guy that he jumped out of the skillet in, out from the firing pan into the what? Fire. Fire. Hot spot. Boy, they're really in trouble. They get back over to the land, and they're so haughty today, aren't they? This is our land! No, it's not. <laughs> it's God's land. It's not their land, it's God's land. And they won't have it until they repent. And they haven't repented yet. And they want to fight. they got a prime minister over right now that would like to start World War III. Because this is his land, God gave it to them. He didn't give it to them until they repent. Now God called them back for His name's sake, not for their name's sake. And when they repent, they're going to have it all. But they haven't repented yet, have they? Alright, Revelation 11. I mean, Revelation 1. Revelation 1. Anybody got that book in their Bible? Revelation 1. And it's right there, right near the end. Yeah. Revelation 1. What do you want to hear? Uh, well, let's look. Let's go back. and Verse number 4, Rex. Let's start right there. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's talking about the whole ministry of Jesus Christ. Who is... He existed forever. He was. He became. John 1, 14. John 1, 1. He existed forever. John 1, 14. Kaiho Logo, Socks again. And the Jehovah flesh he became. And who is to come? He's going to come back. And Israel's going to be in a lot of trouble when he comes back. All right? He's going to come back for his own first, and then he's going to come back to, 
who saved Israel. All right? Go on, Brother Acts. Uh, and, seven, and from the, the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. The okay, Lord. the firstborn means the head. All right? All right? The head and the firstborn from the dead ones. By the way, Jesus is the head of all creation. He's the head of all creation. Okay, go ahead, Brother X. From Jesus Christ, faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the rulers, ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. All right, well, now this is going to wander right along. And he has made us to be a kingdom priest, priest to his God and Father, to him he... To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now verse 7. Here we go. This came from the Old Testament. Now here it is in the New Testament. We looked at this in the book of Ezekiel, the 36th chapter. Now we're going to look at it in Revelation chapter 1. Go ahead, brother. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and ever I will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. All right. And he said, I am Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, Jehovah Elohim, who was, who, who is, who was, and who is to come, El Shaddai. That's what it means, El Shaddai. Is that what it's, in that, uh, Bill, have you got your second name? Yeah, no, you don't have one. It'll, it'll, it's El Shaddai. El Shaddai, the Almighty. El Shaddai. I went on Brother Roger's uh, house the other night on Friday night and had a good time over there in Dakota. They had a college get-together over there. And one of the boys had a, sh a shirt on that says El Shaddai. And they were saying, what does that mean? What? They, well, they couldn't read it. It was in Hebrew. And I said, that's El Shaddai. I said, that's the all-nourishing one, the Almighty. Because that's what it was. And here it is in the New Testament. In the book of James, it's also there. All right? This is the one. All right, now go back to uh, Psalm. To Psalm. All right, we're just one bouncing around all over. The Bible, no Bible, no word, no no scriptures of private interpretation, is it? Psalm one. Not by itself. Psalm uh, uh, one eighteen at verse twenty six. Psalm one hundred eighteen verse twenty six. Psalm one eighteen verse twenty six. Then we're going to go back into the New Testament again. In Matthew, the twenty first chapter. <coughs> And Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Who's got Psalm 118, verse 26? John, are you over there at all? Okay. Yes. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. All right. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yes. All right. Jesus said to Israel, You will not see me again until they said, Baruch Hashem. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All right. Baruch. Blessed is the one that comes in the Hashem, the name of the Lord. And what is Jesus? The, 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 when you come across the name, he who, he who shall become. Alright, they call that the name. Hashem. The name. They call it the name or the word. Jehovah. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he is comes in. Jehovah. <coughs> Jehovah. They won't, see, they won't see him again until they say, Blessed and holy is he that came in the name of the Lord. Matthew, the 23rd chapter, verses uh, about 32 through 39. Matthew 23. Let's see who Jesus is talking about talking to over here. I think it's the same bunch that's over here in the land today. Matthew 23. Matthew 23. All right. Good morning. Uh, start with about I'm going to read it to you pretty quickly so we're going to go back and we're going to just see some things Jesus uses a hyperbole here woe to you scribes Pharisees hypocrites for you you tithe the mint and the dill and the cumin you tithe out of your out of your spice gardens at home you're supposed to tithe out of the field but they got spice gardens in their backyard he says you tithe out of there but you have neglected the weightier provisions of all, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. But these are the, are the things that you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out the gnat and swallow a camel. That is a hyperbole. 
A, a gnat is a little fly. You can swallow a gnat easily and not ever know it. But how many of you have swallowed a camel without knowing it? Have any of you ever swallowed a camel? What is that, Brian? Huh? No, no, camel. What is a camel? That's one, a, one of that, those animals that are in the desert. How could I follow one of those? They're so huge. I'll ride a camel. It's, it's like this. Gamil. The word gamil means, uh, it means gift. Gamaliel, remember the teacher Gamaliel in the Bible? His name, it means gift of God. Beneficial of God. Benefit of God. The word camel means benefit. But a camel was an unclean animal. You couldn't eat a camel. Did you know that? You couldn't eat a camel. You weren't supposed to eat one. Not to eat a camel. But he said you gulp down a camel in one swallow. That's what you call a heart, an exaggeration. You strain out a gnat, you take a cloth, and you strain wine through, or water through there, so you won't drink the gnat. And then you gulp down with one gulp a big camel that's an unclean animal. That's what you call a hyperbole. It's an exaggeration. It's impossible to swallow a camel, isn't it? It's impossible for a, for a camel to go through the eye of a sewing needle, isn't it? Those are two hyperboles that Jesus used. Impossibility. Okay? He said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a sewing needle than a rich man to get into heaven. All right? That's what he said. And right here, it says you strain out the gnat, but you swallow down a whole camel. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Or, what does the word hip hypocrites? What does that word mean? Two-faced? Huh? Persons, persons that are not a, a pretender. A pretender. It comes from a, a mask. The word in the Greek theater, in the Roman theater, they used to have, how many of you used to watch the, the matinees on television? They had three masks on television. Remember that little show that had three masks? This is probably too old for most of you. They had three masks. Well, in the Greek theater, that one actor would act He's a hypocrites, and he'd act behind the mask, and he'd say, ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or I don't hear, you know, they would say different things, and they act like different parts. He said, these people are actors. They're acting the part, but they are, they are acting like they're God's people, but they're not. You hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of uh, robbery. That means to snatch things away. Pickpockets. <laughs> And self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you are like the whitewashed tombs which are on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside are what? Full of nasty, corrupt, rotting, decaying, smelly bones. Even you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Israel today is the same thing. They're no better shape today than they were then. But they're God's people. God will use them in spite of them. But God's got to break them first. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets, adorn the monuments of the righteous. And what? how, how did they get killed? And they say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them shedding the blood of the prophets. What did they do to Jesus? They demanded his death. Consequently, you bear witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up the measure of guilt for, of your fathers. Fill it up. Fill it up. God, it talks about swelling indignation. The word is orge in Greek. It means like a fruit. How many of you ever had fruit fruits? Or a, a vegetable garden. And the fruit or the vegetable gets so ripe and everything, what does it do finally? It breaks and ruptures. That's like God. He's so full of it. Up to here with them. All right? Up to there. He's sick and tired. <laughs> the old term. Sick and tired. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how shall you escape the sentence of hell? Therefore, 
before I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you killed and you crucified. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. And upon, all, upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous bloodshed on earth from the guilt of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Bacchiara who you murdered between the temple and the altar. <coughs> Truly I say to you all these things shall come upon this generation. And I'm going to tell you something. The generation that's in Israel today are headed for the jaws of hell and the hands of the Antichrist. Two-thirds of them are going to be murdered by him. Did you know that? Two-thirds are going to die. O oh, Jerusalem, O oh, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to you, how often I would have gathered your children together as the way a mother hen clucks for her little chickens under her wings, and you were not. What? willing. You were not willing. They were elected, weren't they? God, Israel, and the church is elected. The election in the Bible, you don't talk about it. actually that's eclego in the Bible. Picked out. You were picked out alright, but you weren't willing. You were picked out, but you weren't willing. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on you shall not see me until what? You until you say, Blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what Israel's got to say. If Israel wants to be on God's side, that's what they're going to have to say. Now they're not going to say, We got the title deed to the land, right in the Bible. The title deed to the <laughs> land comes through when they repent. When they repent. Go back now to the book of Ezekiel. Does this make more sense to you? Does it? And I will multiply the fruit tree of the produce in verse... Uh, he said he's going to put his spirit with them. Israel's going to be born in one day. When they see the Messiah and all the armies of the Antichrist coming after them, all the armies in the, in the, in the valley of Armageddon. Armageddon. We talk about Armageddon. Old Harold Camping keeps talking about the end of the world. You know, he's moved it from September. Uh, May the 21st, now to October the 21st. He said his mathematics were off just a little bit. Oh. I think it's off a whole lot more than that. Because it could happen today. He's following the equinoxes. Hey, the man's taking a guess. You know, tell you Jeremiah. Jeremiah 16, 14 through 17. Go to Jeremiah 16th chapter. Okay, Jeremiah 16, 14. 2.17. Jeremiah 16, 14 through 17. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God will restore everything. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Bill. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. But the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the lands of the north upon all the lands where he had driven them. For I will bring them back into their land which I gave to their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. And afterwards I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill, out of folds and rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways, they are not hidden from my face, nor is there iniquity hidden from my eyes. <laughs> no, that's their iniquity. Their sins are still there. You know what God's going to bring Israel back in their land? They're still steeped in sin. They're still sinners. Ungodly buzzards, as Brother, Herb, Brother Madden used to call them. Ungodly buzzards. Not fit for the kingdom of God. And two-thirds of them aren't going to ever get there. But one-third of them is going to be born again in the day. He said, I will firstly, I will first doubly repay their iniquity and their sin. Alright? Because they have polluted my land and have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable idols and with their abominations. And even sometimes the word of God that they kiss over there can become an idol to them. Israel, when they went into Babylon, 
when they went into Assyria, when they went into these places, they got sick of uh, idols. God finally made them sick of idols. God, they brought idols into the land. Look at Solomon. Solomon. Well, right there in Jerusalem, right where Jerusalem is, now you look down in this little thing up here, and you're looking down from the Mount of Olives on to, into Jerusalem. Jerusalem's a little lower. Every high hill around Jerusalem, around the temple of God that Solomon built, was a higher place where idols were, looking down upon the temple of God. And every one of them had priests and workers in them. Just think about that for a while. Here we've got Solomon building the temple of God and then building a gob of pagan temples all around it and higher than it was. Oh, And Brother X. Oh, I've always wondered Solomon was supposed to be the most intelligent man in the world. You can be smart and dumb at the but same time, brother. Smart. You can be smart and dumb at the same time. You can be smart and dumb at the same time. I was here in the working copy in the the book of Genesis that I had written here a while back and and one of the pastors was standing there and he said, Man, wow, I've never seen anybody do something like this before. This is unbelievable. I said, well, that's about all I'm good for. <laughs> I am so shy out in public and everything, I'm just worthless in some way for the Lord. But I try to teach God's Word and communicate it. I try to be a communicator. I was Brother Rogers' house the other night. We were talking about different things. I said, you know what? I said, I said in a lot of ways, I'm just absolutely worthless for the Lord. He said, you're a scholar. He said, all real scholars are like you. They're shy, they're backward, and they keep for themselves. That's the way they do it. He said, John A. Robinson, A.T. Robertson, all of these great scholars were like that. But I hope that I'm useful to some extent. See, this is all I'm good for. <laughs> you make use of your talents, whatever they are. Whatever they are, you make use of them. Do it. Why, you may not be able to do anything but go out here and clean a bathroom for the Lord. But do it. Clean the bathroom. Whatever you can do, do it. Do it with all your might. He said, then uh, you will remember your evil ways and your deeds, that they were not good. And you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for the iniquities of your abominations. That's in verse number 31 in Ezekiel 36. For I'm not doing this for your sake. God just keeps saying that. I've brought you back in the land. I've made the land sprout for you. The trees are growing. The land is sprouting. It's responding to your touch. But what's doing that? What did it say in Romans 8 chapter in the very beginning of the class? For the creation itself mourns for the redemption of the Son of God. When we really become heirs of God. The earth won't suffer anymore. The earth has suffered. The trees have suffered. The animals have suffered because of us. Back in the, in the millennia reign when God puts Israel in the land over here and Israel becomes administrators on earth of God's kingdom. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they like to say that they, want, they don't want to go to heaven. They want to go to the kingdom. You ever heard that? You ever heard that, Brother Ray? Mm -hmm. How are you going to get to the kingdom? You've got to go through the tribulation period. I don't want to be in the kingdom. I want to be in heaven. <laughs> but these Jews are going to go through the tribulation period. They're going to be in the kingdom. And they're going to be heads of the kingdom. They're going to be administrators in God's kingdom. But how did they get there? Boy. I'm, so, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought God's kingdom and heaven were the same thing. They're no. Not? No. <clears throat> Let's get that clarified. Thank you. <laughs> because some people don't understand. People say in God's kingdom. Okay. Yeah. The kingdom. Now, when Jesus comes back for us, the rapture, you know, Harold Camping's talking about right now, the rapture, when he raptures all of us up, whoof, all the saved on the earth are, are raptured to be with God. That's, they're raptured up off of the earth. And then God's going to pour the coal to Israel. 
he's going to heat the fires down on the earth. The rapture takes place right here. Is he? Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it talks about the snatching away, the, the gathering away of, of all the saved. And then what's going to happen on the earth? The Antichrist is going to be revealed. The Holy Spirit is going to be taken out as the administrator of God's kingdom today in the churches. And all hell is going to break loose on the earth. And the devil is going to be turned loose. Demons are going to come out from the bottomless pit and be turned loose on the earth. A whole bunch of them are going to be turned loose right over here at the end of that period of time when the worst of the demons are turned out of the bottomless pit, the opisome. That's what it means, no bottom. They're going to be turned loose on the earth and they're going to look like grasshoppers and things that walk on akridos is what the word is in Greek. It's things that walk on tiptoes. Ballerinas, not insects that walk around scorpions. Spiders. Vinegaroons. <laughs> all of these things that walk on their tiptoes. <laughs> all these. What we call, what's the word for it's the scariest? Uh, 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 what's the word for the scariest spiders and all these insects? Whatever it is, an acrophobic. All right, we're going to see all of these acridas out there, walking on their tiptoes, biting people, biting them with deadly wounds, but they won't die. They're going to want to die, but they can't die. That's right. They're going to want to die, but they can't die. God's not going to let them. He's going to make them live in those bodies, and Israel is going to be witnessing all this stuff. And right here, in the first, it's, it, it, Antichrist is going to make a seven-year contract with all the people over there in the world. He's going to bring in his, his period of peace. Right, Revelation 6, and starting with verse 1, where he talked about the white horse. For three and, and a half years. Yeah, for three and a half years, there's going to be peace. He's going to bring in all his peace. And that's when everybody gets the mark of the beast. And we already got it, don't we? We got it. Every nation's got the mark. Ours is our social security number. Everything, you're not going to be, well, right today, you can't go to a doctor without a social security number. You can't get a job, can't have a bank account, can't get a hunting license, can't get a fishing license, can't get a driver's license. Nothing without that number. But when that Antichrist comes on scene, he's going to put it in there and no money, their money won't be worth anything. Gold and silver. I preached that sermon here a while back, no God, no guns, and no gold. And no Dr. Pepper either. <laughs> no root beer flows. The common man won't have anything except enough bread and water, bread and water to eat, and it's going to be like barley, the lowest grade bread. Right now, we're in what we call a depression. These big, big companies are just ripping people up, expecting two and three times. They're doing the work of two and three people just to keep their job, and they cut their benefits and they cut their wages. Wonderful. That happened in 1900. Mm -hmm. Teddy Roosevelt turned it around. We don't have one today to try to do it. You know what I mean? That's what he did. But, what's going to happen? Well, the end is coming. The rapture takes place here. Now on the earth, we still got people running around out down on the earth. Five out of every six people are going to be killed. Gentiles. Two out of every three, three Jews are going to die. That's a lot of bloodshed and a lot of dead bodies on this earth. The earth is going to stink. When wormwood hits the earth, what's wormwood? You may have heard of it, wormwood? Yeah. Wormwood is an, astro an asteroid or a comet that's going to hit the earth and it's going to destroy one-third of all the waters. And all the fish, on, how many of you have been out in the ocean? There's a lot of fish and creeping, crawling creatures down there. You know that fish have lice on them? Did you know that? Yes. And they got fleas and lice on them. That's what you call sea lice. Everything in the water, everything you see on a dog out here, they got dogs in the in the ocean. What's what's a dog in the ocean? What are, what are they? It's the seals. They bark just like a dog, don't they? Got little whiskers like a dog does. They act like little dogs. They bark and go on just like dogs. And they have fleas on them just like dogs. Fish got fleas on them. Everything. Spiders in the ocean. That's the crabs. 
and the lobsters and everything, you know, them real good things you beat down at Red Lobster and all that, you know, that's, what, that's what you call it. That's what you call ocean insects. Okay? By the way, the, the law of Moses, you couldn't eat them. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, they're good. All right. They eat krill, they eat. One third of all the waters are going to be poisoned and, and, and it's going to die and it's going to be contaminated. And when you get all this dead flesh around, we got a doctor in the house. What happens, brother doctor? Stink. It stinks. And disease. <laughs> Disease and stench and death from that. All this kind of stuff. Boy. And, but on the earth now. God's getting ready to bring in His kingdom on the earth. He's already... Where is the church and all the saved? Where are they? They're above the earth in New Jerusalem. That city that Jesus said, I go away and I build a house for you. I build many, many, homes, many, many rooms in this mansion. Just a mansion over the hilltop. That's the one I'm looking for. The mansion over the hilltop. The mansion over the hilltop. Which is the one in heaven? Yeah. But down on this earth now, God is getting ready to use Israel. At the end of that tribulation period, He saves Israel. And then Israel, one third of the Jews that live, they go in there and they rule over one sixth of the Gentiles that are left on this earth. And they teach them how to serve God after they've learned how for 1,000 years, and then the earth is repopulated for 1,000 years. The earth is populated again. And a lot of people grow up, and guess what they do when they grow up? Some of them, you know, there's no devil. The devil's in the bottomless pit now. Look at here. Revelation 27 through 9. He's in the bottomless pit. He's not around. There aren't any demons on the earth to bother anybody. Have you ever been bothered by demons? <laughs> Probably. Probably we have. I know I have. Been married to a couple of them. <laughs> I didn't mention the third one, did I? <laughs> you drove that man away. <laughs> I run him from all. I scared him to death. We look at this. We look at all this. Here we have, in heaven, we have heaven. Hashemayim, Uranois, up there in heaven. We got heaven up above. And everything's breaking, hell is breaking loose on earth, boy. I mean, it's bad. But then God is going to, well, over here in the book of Ezekiel, we're going to find out where God's going to, I don't want to get too far ahead, but uh, there's nuclear war. There's nuclear war over there. And it said that they don't go into the land for how many months? Seven months. And they go in there, and when somebody goes out there and they find a dead body or something, they call in the professional people. What's it sound like? Yeah, man. Huh? What does it sound like? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the hazardous waste people. Oh, it's in hazmat. Hazmat. All right. This is, I mean, they got hazmat people right over there. And we're, we see contaminated. And what has happened when they run into these people? They're contaminated with radiation. So they go in there and they call the professionals in and they go bury them. They're burying people for six and seven and eight months. And then they go out there and find some more of them. Still hazmat. And they go out there and... Genocide. A lot of people die. Five, six, five ever, ever six Gentiles in the world is going to die. That's a lot of dead bodies. <laughs> and they're going to bury them down there south of the Dead Sea, downwind of everything, in a hazardous waste zone that's going to be there. You know, the Bible tells us a lot about this stuff. we got a hazardous waste zone out here uh, by uh, McKittrick, and we got one out there by Avenel, don't we? Yeah. We're going to have one down there. The Bible tells us where it's going to be. It's down there south of the Dead Sea. Yeah. Boy, that's quite a story, isn't it? <laughs> Heaven's going to be a good place. Heaven is not going to be contaminated with any of this. We're going to be up there having dinner with Jesus. And well, all this is going to be breaking loose on the earth. Them Jews down there that, that say they're God's people, that's going to get, get getting right. Well, they're going through the ringer. You know what's happening? Have you ever been washed with lye soap? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. I remember when my cousin Bill came from Oklahoma from Balls Valley out here, and Mary said, I made some lye soap. He said, I don't want any. <laughs> He had lye soap before. 
I tell you what, it just about takes your skin off. The lice on my poor old grandma, her hands were breaking and going on all the time. She took in laundry and sat there and rubbed them on a rub board with lye soap. She'd take that lye soap and grind it up with a cheese, you know what they say, like you did with farmers on cheese. She'd put it in there and wash them up by hand. And take them out there and had a flat iron. Do you know what flat iron is? Anybody know what a flat iron is? Yeah. Joseph, you know what a flat iron is? No. That's an old iron. It's an old smoothing iron you heat on the stove. A smoothing iron. You took it, you heat it on the stove. And in the like summertime, the stove, with a stove in the house, <laughs> with flat irons that's hot talk about slaving over a hot stove in those days they knew what slaving over a hot stove was Most of the clothes they ever put in the winter time it's nice to slave over a hot stove but in the summer time it's rough slaving over a hot stove and you're sweating you're trying to keep the sweat that's dripping off of you off those clean clothes that you washed for some customer there wasn't no regal free clothes either no and with them, they all had to be ironed. And with them, I'm sure they could the Let's think about that. Now, they, God's going to purify them with lye soap. The lye soap is the Antichrist and his army. He's going to got all the all the dross off of them. Going to scrub them real good and get them ready for the kingdom of God. He buys off them. That's um, you work in concrete with no gloves or something? Yeah. Your hands will literally dry out like, and they'll right. puff up yeah. uh -huh. and get real swollen yeah. and they'll crack. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, That's all part of that. He's going to work them over. <laughs> They're going to get a work over. They're going to get a, what they call a major makeover. We talk about different people going out here. Out there by me, there was a, they, they called the, the movie star farm out there. If they, it was a, what's it called? Radical makeover or something? Complete makeover. It's some kind of a deal they had Extreme it out. Makeover. Extreme makeover. Right out there, some uh, this man or this man got killed out there and his wife and left his wife and children. And they went in there and built them a house and a barn and planted a few acres of alfalfa for them and everything else out there. That's where we go buy our horse feed for the coach horse. It's out there at the, to the movie, I call them the movie star barn. Mm -hmm. God is going to make over. He's going to do a radical makeover with Israel and Israel will be worth something when he gets through with it. But Israel is still worthless for the kingdom of God right now. They got to be washed with lye soap still. They have to be cleaned up. Old uh, Jacob one time he said, uh, yeah. <laughs> "Wives, get the clothes all, get the kids all ready, wash them real good, and put them on clean clothes. We're going to Bethel, the house of God. Israel's going to be." ready for the house of God when God gets through with them. And for 1,000 years, at the end of this period of time now, for 1,000 years, God's going to restore the kingdom. And they're going to be administrators of God's kingdom on earth. And at the end of that period of time now, there's going to be something to take place over here. What's this? The destruction of the earth and new heaven and earth, 1 Peter 3, 10 through 13, you got a copy of this chart. Read these scriptures by it. You'll learn a whole lot. Revelation 21, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. The new heavens and the new earth. Ezekiel and Isaiah tell us more about the millennial kingdom than anything else. But the millennial kingdom lasts 1,000 years. Milliannum. Millennium. The by a lot of these, uh, uh, what you call... Superlapsarian hyper-Calvinist. <laughs> they don't believe in the millennium at all. <laughs> Superlapsarian hyper-Calvinist. Okay. They don't believe in the in the in the millennium at all. They say the word millennium is not in the Bible, but the word millennium is it's kelia in the Bible. Ater, kelia, ater, a thousand years. If you translate it in Latin, it's millianum, a thousand years. It's there. Millianum. They just don't like it. Thousand year reign is in there, but at the end of that thousand year reign, God is going to cleanse the earth again, finally and completely. All of everybody's going to go, all the bad people, all the graves, you know, there are still graves of dead people on this earth. God's even going to get the dead carcasses and resurrect them of the bad people. They're going to be totally 86 from his earth. And those dead bodies are going to be resurrected, corrupt still, in a corrupt state, and thrown into the lake of fire forever. The resurrection of the dead.
The resurrection of the dead. What does Gamal mean? Gamalim? What does Gamalim mean? That's camel. It's a gift, it's a benefit. Israel will be a benefit like a camel to God one of these days. For the thousand year reign, they're going to serve the Lord on the earth. Uh, uh, will Israel be protected till the tribulation starts? Uh, Israel will. Israel is going to be in the land. God has called them back in the land. But they've still got their snoots in the air, don't they? They still got the deed, the title deed to the land, they say now. And we're going to take it off. Okay? Let me tell you a little bit about history. When Israel went back in the land, they were, they were allowed a certain area to stay in, which was very, very little. Okay? May the 14th, 1948, when, when the uh, League of Nations, when the uh, League of Nations declared them as a nation, five Arab nations uh, attacked them instantly. They whooped them all, not because of their ability, but because God was going to keep them there. And they took some land. That's what we call a buffer zone. That's what we call occupied territory. They were never supposed to really do anything with that land. It was what you call a buffer zone. But then later on they started building building um, cities in those areas. They were never supposed to do that according to the contract. Now they want to know if all the contracts and take it all and say God gave it to us. Well, God did give it to Abraham. Abraham never had it. Jacob never had it. And they don't have it today. They've got the city of Jerusalem, but they can't walk into the city of Jerusalem, can they? During the Antichrist reign, they're going to be able to walk into the city of Jerusalem. They're going to build a temple there, and the Jews and the Gentiles, but the temple they're going to be built there, that's going to be built there, just think about it now. These Jews are awful high-minded and high-snooted about it. But they're going to build a temple that is going to be a universal temple for anybody. If you read down there, that temple is going to be for all Muslims and everything else. They're going to all, it's going to be what we call a universal religion. They're all going to be, all states, you're going to be a member of the church and the state. And everybody's going to get along. That's what's taking place. That's what we call ecumenism, Brother Rex. It won't last very long, though. It'll last for three and a half years. Yeah, and then he wipes it out. And then he turns and says, I'm God. And when he stands in the, in, the, in the temple area, right in the Holy of Holies, and say, you worship me, and I am God, then the Jews said, those you, uh, Jews that you, you know the Lord, you get off, don't go down from the rooftops, just jump from house to house and get down there to Petra. And even on the way down to Petra, when they start the exodus out of the land, that they don't have anything now. They're going to go down to Arabia, down to Petra. That's where they're going to haul, they're going to haul out of there. Whew and run for their lives. And the Antichrist is going to send his armies after them. How are they going to live down there? God's going to provide for them. For three and a half years, they're going to be protected down there. The, the God's going to use natural, evidently, from what I can understand from the Bible, he's going to use natural resources, and uh, like earthquakes and stuff, to stop the armies. Now just look at the earth where we are today. Things are all messed up, people. Things are really messed up right now in the weather-wise and stuff. We've got earthquakes all over. We've got tornadoes. So many tornadoes, they can't even, they can't even count all the tornadoes. They've never seen so many tornadoes. That's what's going to happen in the end time. It's going to be terrible storms in it. We're going to start right up here in chapter 37 next week, by the way. Are you, did you learn a little bit, Brother Bill? You've been studying Ezekiel. I that the chapter thirty six to me is the most is the best book in the whole book of Ezekiel. Well, all of them are wonderful. This one here, you learned a lot in chapter. What, what we've been on chapter thirty six for two weeks. All right, all right. Well, thank you for putting up with me, Brett. You're going to come up here. Me and Bill are coming up here. All right. We're you team, and Bill. We're team. A team. We're a team for the Lord. All it right. says. It says here, if you want to make a eternal difference in the life of a child this summer, when he turns 18, graduates from high school, kick his butt out. That's, that, that's Bill Hawkins' chapter 1, right there. Uh, we still need workers for the Valley Baptist, Sunday school, summer, summer, summer deal, Valley Baptist deal, you know, if you, you guys are interested in it. Uh, 
they won't let me do it, so I'm a bad influence. Uh, I just want to say that Jim was talking.